Worship this morning. Uh, if you are a guest, maybe first time visitors, uh, visiting us here at First Baptist, maybe first time in a long time, uh, we'd love to get some information from you. Uh, so you can take the connection card in the pew pocket there in front of you, fill it out, and drop it off in our offering boxes on your way out. Or you can just scan uh, the QR code that's on the bottom of those connection cards and fill it out completely uh, online on your phone. Hopefully you grabbed a bulletin uh, on your way in. Uh, be sure to grab one of those before you leave. Those are for you to kind of just know what's going on in the life of our church. Uh, I do have a couple of announcements that you're not going to find um, in your bulletin. The first one is, um, not this Wednesday, but next Wednesday, our studies, the explicit gospel study and the marriage study, will be postponed because of business meeting. And so that's on February the 16th, not this Wednesday, but next Wednesday. We won't, we won't have our studies uh, during that 6 o'clock to 7 uh, time frame because of business meeting. Um, also, um, on February the 17th at 6 p.m., uh, we will be hosting here in the Fellowship Hall the Baptist Student Union Mission Banquet. Uh, and so this is a banquet that the BSU puts on uh, to raise funds to help subsidize the cost uh, of their students who go on summer missions. And so um, if you'd like to be a part of that, uh, you can buy tickets. You can buy them from me, um, from Austin, or from Zach Hardy, the BSU director at uh, Delta State. And so again, that's February the 17th at 6 p.m. here at the Fellowship Hall. Also, this is our first Sunday in February, and so we have a new monthly mission emphasis. Uh, that's going to be our New Orleans uh, ministry as well as our prison ministry. And so one thing that I really uh, just kind of want to let you guys know, uh, for the prison ministry specifically, you can just be praying that the Lord would begin to open the doors for us to kind of get back uh, and doing some of those things. And so 
for, for whatever reason, those people who make the decisions about who can go in and who cannot uh, still have not decided to allow um, church members to go in and be a part of Bible studies and things like that. Uh, and so we would love uh, your prayers, uh, especially just during this month, that the, those who make those decisions would open the doors so we can begin to do more ministry back there again. Uh, and also, before we get started with our worship time, I want to remind us of our Who's Your One initiative uh, and pray for those who are close to us but far from God. Uh, our passage today comes from Matthew chapter 9, verses 1 through 2. It says, So he got into a boat, Jesus. Uh, he crossed over and he came to his own town. And just then, some men brought to him a paralytic lying on a stretcher. And seeing their faith, Jesus told the paralytic, Have courage, son, your sins are forgiven. So what we see in this passage is as Jesus is out ministering, he's known to heal people, he's known uh, to help them, and someone, uh, them, these men bring one of their friends probably, uh, who's a paralytic, to Jesus for him to heal them. And instead of healing him physically first, he heals him spiritually. And so when we think of the people that we're going to come in contact this week, those people who are close to us but far from God, uh, you might have conversations about things that are going on in their life um, that are very physical in nature. Uh, maybe there's some issues that are going on, some crisis that they're dealing with, something that's going on that prompts them to have a conversation with you about the things that are going on in their life. And you can use those opportunities as opportunities to speak the good news of who Jesus is and what he's done for you into those, those circumstances. And so uh, I'd encourage you that if you have those conversations, those meetings with people this week, that you would see them as kind of gospel opportunities to share the good news of who Jesus is. So let me pray for those uh, who are close to us but far from the Lord. Well, you are good, and you are faithful, Father. We thank you for a time that we can come and we can sing your praises, Father. We can make much of you, and we can be reminded of your goodness and your grace and your forgiveness of our own sins. Father, help us to be diligent to extend that good news of your forgiveness for our sins to those who have never experienced it. Father, give us uh, your spirit to, to see the different circumstances and situations and conversations that you are leading us to so that we can make much of your son. Father, we love you, and it's in Christ's name. Amen. Good morning, everyone. If you would please stand as we begin our time of worship, singing How Great Is Our God.
5:19 says, "But you, O Lord, reign forever. Your throne endures to all generations."
Father, I just thank you for this day and thank you for let us, letting us be able to gather here this morning and sing praises to your name. Just pray that you would be with us throughout our week, that we would bring glory and honor to your name and be with us this morning as we listen and receive your word. And I just pray that you would bless us and be with us. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.
much, choir. Well, good morning, church. It's good to see you here this morning for worship on this Lord's Day. Let's go ahead now, if you haven't already, and grab our Bibles and turn now to the book of Revelation. Revelation 17. <clears throat> well, we are making our way through this mysterious yet encouraging book of the Bible, the book of Revelation. We've come now to chapter 17, of course, and uh, last week um, we actually looked at the last of the seven series judgments that are found here in the book of Revelation. Um, I'll put these up on the screen for you so you can see them. Uh, the first was the seven seal judgments. We looked at several weeks ago back in chapter 6, uh, 7, and 8. And then uh, right after that, we looked at the seven trumpet judgments. And then thirdly, in chapter 16, we looked at this last week, we looked at the seven bold judgments found in, uh, in chapters 15 and 16. And so these seven bold judgments that we looked at last, last week, these seven bold judgments, like the other judgments, actually, again, describe for us um, how God is bringing about His judgment upon a Christ-rejecting, sinful world. And as you read through these judgments, you see things like disease, famine, war, death, uh, natural disasters. A lot of these judgments we have seen in the past. Uh, a lot of these judgments we are seeing presently. And most assuredly, uh, we will see these things in the future as we all eagerly await the return of Christ. In other words, in many ways, these judgments here are very common uh, to every generation. Every generation. Now, the last bold judgment uh, found at the end of chapter 16 that we looked at last week, the last bold judgment, is described as the, the, the destruction of Babylon. The destruction of Babylon. Now, who or what is Babylon? Um, well, the word Babylon actually comes from the word Babel. And for you Bible students, that word should bring to your mind uh, a story that is told in Genesis chapter 10 and 11 that is referred to as the Tower of Babel. How many of you are familiar with that story, the Tower of Babel? It's an interesting story, unique story. Um, but that is the first place this, this word Babel shows up in the Bible. Uh, it said there that as the people on earth began to grow in number after the flood, many of the people there settled into this place called Shinar, this area region of Shinar. And it was there where they not only built a city, but they also, the Bible says, built this giant tower that reached all the way to heaven, as far as they could reach to heaven, so that, they did this, so that they would be famous all around the world. That everyone would hear of them and their tower and they would go, oh, yeah, check out those people in Shinar. They built this gi ginormous tower that reaches to the sky. Now, why was that such a problem? Here's the problem. The problem is because that was all done in direct defiance of what God had told them to do. God had told them that they were to uh, multiply and not gather, but scatter. He wanted them to multiply and cover the earth so that his glory would be made known all over. However, they stood in defiance against this command. They did not want to scatter, nor did they want God receiving glory. Rather, they wanted to stay put, and they wanted to make a name for themselves. And as a result, God confused their language. You know the story forcing them to relocate and to scatter. And as a result of God confusing their language and all of them babbling, uh, that place became known as the city of Babel, the city of Babel, which just kind of is a little interesting side note. Uh, I find it kind of interesting and somewhat comical that the guy who led the charge in the Tower of Babel is a guy by the name of Nimrod. Nimrod. And of course, we know that today that is a word that is used to refer to someone that is not very smart, a Nimrod. Um, but indeed, defying God's commands is not very smart. It's not, it's not wise. But anyways, nonetheless, century later, we would, we would read of the Babylonians who would invade the city of Jerusalem and not only destroy the city, but also the temple of God there in 586 B.C. Again, the Babylonians, uh, these enemies of God from Babylon, 
stood in defiance against the Lord and his people. And so I I tell you all that because throughout the Bible, we see this word Babylon, Babel, we see it show up around 287 times, a lot of times, we see it show up, and in many ways that word is used to describe any city or group of people who would defy God's word and, and live in rebellion to him. And so the word Babylon, it describes this world and its resistance to the Lord. It's the total culture of our world apart from God. And what Revelation 16 last week told us is that the Lord is one day going to put an end to it. Uh, That is, one day he will destroy Babylon, this world, along with all those who follow its ways. Now, as we come here to chapter 17 this morning... Chapter 17, as well as chapter 18, gives us a detailed explanation of the the destruction and the demise of Babylon. And so that's what we're reading here this morning. It speaks in detail of the destruction and the demise of Babylon. So with that, let's read our chapter this morning, and then we will study it. Chapter 17, starting in verse 1, we read this. It says, Then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls came and said to me, Come, I will show you the judgment of the great prostitute who is seated on many waters, with whom the kings of the earth have committed sexual immorality, and with the wine of whose sexual immorality the dwellers on earth have become drunk. And he carried me away in spirit into a wilderness, and I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast that was full of blasphemous names, and it had seven heads and ten horns. The woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet and adorned with gold and jewels and pearls, holding in her hand a golden cup full of abominations and the impurities of her sexual immorality. And on her forehead was written a name of mystery, Babylon the Great, mother of prostitutes and of earth's abominations. And I saw the woman drunk with the blood of the the saints, the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I marveled greatly, But the angel said to me, Why do you marvel? I tell you the mystery of the woman and of the beast with the seven heads and ten horns that carries her. The beast that you saw was and is not and is about to rise from the bottomless pit and go to destruction. And the dwellers on earth whose names have not been written in the book of life from the foundation of the world will marvel to see the beast because it was and is not and is to come. This calls for a mind with wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman is seated. They are also seven heads, five of whom have fallen. One is, the other has not yet come, and when he does come, he he must remain only a little while. As for the beast that was and is not, it is an eighth, but it belongs to the seven, and it goes to destruction. And the ten horns that you saw are ten kings who have not yet received royal power, but they are to receive authority as kings for one hour, together with the beast. These are of one mind, and they hand over their power and authority to the beast. They will make war on the Lamb, and the Lamb will conquer them. For He is the Lord of lords and King of kings, and those with Him are called and chosen and faithful. And the angel said to me, The waters that you saw where the prostitute is seated are peoples and multitudes and nations and languages. And the ten horns that you saw, they and the beast, will hate the prostitute. They will make her desolate and naked and devour her flesh and burn her up with fire. For God has put it into the hearts to carry out his purpose by being of one mind and handing over their royal power to the beast until the words of God are fulfilled. Verse 18. And the woman that you saw is the great city that has dominion over the kings of the earth. Let's pause and pray. Father, we confess, Lord, that this is a very difficult chapter, Lord, for us to study. But Lord, we know and believe and trust that all Scripture is God-breathed and it comes from You. And Lord, it is profitable for us to read and study, Lord. It will teach us and correct us and rebuke us and train us in all righteousness. And so Lord, that's why we study and give ourselves to it. And so Lord, uh, as we do that here this morning, God, we pray that You would indeed speak to us. Lord, if need be, Convict us and challenge us, Lord, maybe where we have uh, rebelled against you. 
And so, Lord, we thank you for the gospel that in Christ, Lord, all those who put their hope and trust in him can be forgiven and be restored and be renewed and redeemed. So, Lord, thank you for the hope that is found in Jesus. And we pray all these things in his holy and precious name. And all God's people said, amen. In um, 1859, Charles Dickens wrote one of his classic novels entitled A Tale of Two Cities. A Tale of Two Cities. It is uh, one that some of you, no doubt, have probably read before, uh, or at the very least, you probably heard of that, that novel. Uh, but the two cities mentioned are London, England, and Paris, France. A Tale of Two Cities. Well, as you read the book of Revelation, you come to understand why this particular book has oftentimes been described as a tale of two cities. Those two cities being the city of Babylon, encompassing all those who reject and ignore Uh, the God of the universe, and refused to submit to Jesus as Lord, and the new city of Jerusalem, which encompasses all those who love Jesus and and worship him. Now, you need to know that these two cities, the city of Babylon and the city of the new Jerusalem, these two cities, these two kingdoms, all throughout the Bible and the book of Revelation, stand in stark contrast with one another. They have different values, different agendas. They have different leaders and citizens. They have different kings, different objectives, and ultimately they have completely different outcomes. And what we find is that every person must decide which kingdom and which city they will choose to reside in. Everyone everyone must decide which group they will choose to unite their lives with. Of course, as believers in Jesus, we are proud citizens of the New Jerusalem, the city of God. We who champion the gospel are loyal. We seek to be loyal ambassadors of our king. And along with that, we wonder, how is it that many would be deceived into thinking that Babylon would actually be the place to dwell in? How is it that many would choose to worship the king of Babylon instead of choosing to worship the king of kings, the king of Jerusalem, who is in fact our king Jesus? Well, in many ways, that's what chapter 17 speaks to. Chapter 17, I believe, speaks of one of the expressions of Babylon. That is, it speaks of one of Satan's many aides who assist him in leading the world astray and into Babylonian captivity. And that is the great prostitute. The great prostitute. Some of your Bibles may use the phrase harlot, the great, the great harlot. Here in this chapter, her identity is revealed... Her tricks are somewhat exposed, and ultimately her destruction is foretold. And so as we study this, let's first look at the prostitute's description. Let's look at her description. Verse 1 says, Then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls came and said to me, Come, I will show you the judgment of the great prostitute, who is seated on many waters, with whom the kings of the earth have committed sexual immorality, and with the wine of whose sexual immorality the dwellers on earth have become drunk. So here, the great prostitute, shall we say, is introduced. Now, first of all, notice that she is called, again, the great prostitute or the great harlot. Uh, She is, in fact, called this several times in this chapter. I believe about four or five times she's called that. And in the Bible, when you read of this word prostitute or, or harlotry, it almost always speaks of idolatry. It speaks of false worship. It speaks of people who are lured away to worship idols and commit spiritual adultery on the Lord. And listen, there are many, many passages, notable passages, about this very subject. Um, A lot of them actually found in the Old Testament. But one of the more well-known stories is actually the story uh, that is found in the book of Hosea. Hosea. Now, for those of you who have If you've never read the book of Hosea and don't know much about the story, I'll kind of give you the cliff notes here this morning. Uh, Hosea is said by many to be uh, like the one person who received the worst ministry assignment ever. (laughs) Okay, and what was he told by God to do? God told Hosea the prophet, he said, God told him, he said, listen, I want you to go and marry a prostitute and have children with her. Like that was his assignment. And so the Bible says Hosea obeys the Lord and marries a prostitute by the name of Gomer, which just as a side note, if you're looking for a good Bible name to name your daughter, 
please, whatever you do, do not name her Gomer, okay? Um, if, it's going to be a tough life for her moving forward, so don't do that. Nonetheless, Hosea obeys God, marries a prostitute named Gomer. They have a son together, okay? Well, after some time, the Bible tells us that Gomer actually returns to her, her old ways of prostitution. Uh, she cheats on Hosea and eventually leaves him for another man, one who uses her and then uh, abuses her and ultimately sells her back into the, uh, the market. But then God tells Hosea to do, to do something. He says, go again and love that woman who is an adulteress. Now, I want you to keep in mind here, okay, Hosea is a real person. It's just like you and me, okay? That story is not a fairy tale. It is not a parable. It's a real story. And this is a real guy with real emotions. And so as God tells him to go and redeem that woman, to buy her back and to love her again, he's got to be thinking to himself, whoa, 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 wait a minute. Do what? I mean, this woman has embarrassed me. She has humiliated me. She, she has left me. And you want me to go and, and, and bring her back? God's like, that's exactly what I want you to do. And so Hosea, he obeys the Lord. He goes, redeems Gomer. He brings her back. And in Hosea chapter 3, verse 1, we are given insight into why God tells Hosea to do that. Hosea chapter 3, verse 1 reads this way. It says, Go again and love this woman who is an adulteress, even as the Lord loves the children of Israel, though they turn to other gods. You see, the story of Hosea and Gomer is really this big, giant metaphor. It's a big, giant picture that God gives us to illustrate the sin of spiritual adultery and spiritual harlotry, as well as communicate God's heart to those who belong to Him. That God loves us, His people, with an unconditional love. Praise God for that. Yet, our flirting and chasing after the things of this world, we need to know, is spiritual adultery. Spiritual unfaithfulness. And so again, the book of Hosea is one of several examples in the Bible where God uses this metaphor of unfaithfulness or, 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 or one who plays the role of a harlot or prostitute. He uses that to speak of how people will turn away from him and they will turn to the things of this world. They'll turn to the things of Babylon, so to speak. And so when you read here in Revelation 17 of this great prostitute and how she leads, verse 2, the kings of the world into sexual immorality, he's not talking about literal sexual immorality so much as spiritual unfaithfulness. He's speaking of this, get this, he's speaking of this allurement that comes from this world, from Babylon, that seeks to entice and lead people into false worship. I mean, read it again about her, about her appearance. Verse 4, it says, The woman, get this, the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet and adorned with gold and jewels and pearls. Do you see the attractiveness here from the prostitute? Do you see the charm, the, the seductiveness in her? He adds that she holds in her hands a golden cup, but it is full of abominations and impurities of her sexual immorality. And so again, the aim under the direction of the red dragon, Satan, is to lure people into spiritual unfaithfulness. Turning people from faithfulness to God to spiritual fornication and harlotry. Listen, where we are giving our hearts and our affections over to the things of Babylon. And my friend, listen to me. We see this so much in our culture. Listen, the constant pursuit that people have towards things like power and success, the lust for material possessions and sexual pleasure. Listen, people, especially in our own country, are being absolutely intoxicated by the things of Babylon. And possibly, unknowingly, many have been led into buying this American dream that says, bigger is better. Get all you can, spend all you can. Eat, drink, and be merry, for, for tomorrow we die. Just live it up. Many, sadly, have bought into what the great harlot is selling, and they end up wondering why they have no joy, they have no peace, and they have no hope that things will get any better. 
As one commentator said, seduced by the sirens and idols of the day, we run madly down a path of spiritual and eternal suicide. That is the culture in which we live. And the prostitute is luring many into the seduction. You know, it sort of reminds me of a story I once heard about a woman who found that she was rather lonely and sometimes depressed following the passing of her husband. She needed something in her life to kind of fill her time and possibly even to lift her spirits. So she took a trip to the pet store and she purchased a, a parakeet and brought the bird home. She began to speak to the parakeet, but the bird wouldn't talk back. And the woman talked and talked and talked for more than a week, but still no response from the bird. Well, the widow went back to the pet store, explained the problem to the, the owner there. She told him, or, and the owner told her, he said, well, see, the problem is you need to buy the bird a mirror. That's what you need to do. You need to get the bird a mirror so that it sees itself in the mirror. Then it will feel at home, and then it'll, it'll start talking. So the widow bought the mirror, placed it in the cage. But a week later, the bird still wouldn't talk. So the lady went back to the pet store, and this time, the owner told her, said, well, you need, to, you need to buy a swing. You bought the mirror, but you also need to buy the bird, the parakeet, a swing. The parakeet has to be on the swing, swinging while looking at itself in the mirror in order for it to start talking. So she bought the swing, put it in the cage, and she began talking to the bird, but still the bird wouldn't talk. A week went by, and the lady returned to the pet store complaining, saying this crazy bird still won't talk. The man said, well, there's one more thing you can do. Get a ladder. Yeah, get a ladder so that the parakeet can walk up and down on the ladder. Then the bird will feel, will feel better and begin talking. Well, begrudgingly, she bought the ladder, and another week, week went by without the bird saying anything. However, at the end of that week, the bird dropped over dead, killed over. The widow was angry now. She marched back to the pet store and told the owner, she said, that parakeet you sold me has now died. I bought the mirror, I bought the swing, I bought the ladder, and that bird didn't say anything. It just fell over dead. The owner looked at her puzzled and was like, man, I just cannot believe that that parakeet died. He said, but did it say anything before it died? The woman look, looked at him and said, well, matter of fact, it, it did. After it fell over, it looked up with one eye open and said, don't they sell any food at that pet store? <laughs> Same response from the first two services. I don't know. Uh, lame story. I get it. Thank you, Maddie. <laughs> but here's the problem. Here's the problem. You know what the problem was. The problem was that the woman was buying all the wrong stuff, and it led to death. And listen, there are a lot of people who are pursuing and chasing after and buying all, this, all the things that this world has to offer, thinking that somehow all those things will give them fulfillment and satisfaction. But listen, it doesn't. And some of you here this morning, as you sit, listen, you've been pursuing and chasing, chasing after all these things that this world has to offer, thinking that it will satisfy you, and maybe for the first time you're coming to the realization that it won't do it. It, it, it. Listen, it will never be able to completely satisfy you. It will only leave you high and dry in the end. And so I tell you that to say this, beware of the great prostitute in her seduction. Listen, she seeks to allure you into turning away from the Lord who is the only one who can completely, eternally satisfy you and fulfill you. All right, well, from the prostitute's description, we next see the prostitute's drunkenness. It's found in verse 6, the prostitute's drunkenness. We read in verse 6, it says this, And I saw the woman drunk with the blood of the saints, the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. Now, the idea of the, prostitutes, the prostitute being drunk with the blood of the saints and the martyrs is yet another description here in the book of Revelation of the persecution that the people of God will endure while living as exiles here in Babylon. And so the Bible is clear, and we've talked about this a number of times. Listen, as we live as foreigners and strangers in this world as Christians, mark it down, take it to the bank, we can expect persecution. It's 2 Timothy 3.12. All who desire to live godly lives in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. You know, as we talk about that, I can't help but think about the biblical illustration that we have in the book of Daniel. The book of Daniel. Many of you know the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. It's a very popular story, even amongst those who aren't, aren't uh, believers. But here are these three Hebrew boys, the Bible says, that are living in the actual city of Babylon as, as exiles. 
They are worshipers of God, yet they are living in a foreign pagan world. In many ways, just like us as Christians, as we live our lives in this world. Let me remind you, Christian, that this place that we live is not our home. This world is not our home, so don't get too comfortable here. We are strangers. We are sojourners. We're, we're just simply passing through. And as we pass through living in a foreign land, we are called to honor the Lord until we arrive home. Well, in Daniel chapter 3, we're told where these three Hebrew boys are commanded to bow down and worship the image of the king, King Nebuchadnezzar. Now, you need to know that one of the things that the Babylonians would do as a, as a, as a nation is that whenever they would overcome uh, another nation, they would take the, the captives and they would bring them back to Babylon. But as they brought them back to Babylon, they wouldn't just like put them to work, but they would also seek to ingrain those captives into, into the Babylonian culture. In short, what they would do is they would take these foreigners from the nations that they conquered, they would take these foreigners into their land and they would teach them about what it means to be a Babylonian which again is what our world today seeks to do to us. I don't know if you've noticed this, but our world will try to seek to press us into its mold, to become just like this world, to become Babylonians. And church, Christian, we must, we must resist this. But these three Hebrew boys were called to worship this image, yet they refused because of their love and devotion to God. And as a result, you know the story, they were thrown where? Into the fiery furnace. They were punished... Yet, they were miraculously saved by the Lord. But they were being punished for standing their ground and not giving in to the cultural pressure to just be like everybody else. And Christian, listen to me. If you're going to be a man and a woman who will carry the banner for Christ, then this will take courage and this will take devotion. Because defiance against Babylon in this world is indeed costly. It is costly to follow Christ faithfully. And this cost, I believe, will only increase in this country that we are living in. However, if we are faithful despite unwarranted persecution, boy, what a witness we can be for a watching world. In fact, this past week I came across a collection of writings called the Letter of Diagnetus. It is a second or third century. They're not quite sure what century this, this work was uh, completed in, but it's a, a second or third century work that actually speaks of and defends the Christian faith. And so this person, we're not quite sure who it is, but they noticed Christians living, the early church, they noticed how they were living, and they were so compelled that they wrote down what they saw about these believers. And at the end of chapter 5, it contains a brief yet amazing description of the witness of these first century Christians, even in the face of hostility. It says this about, these, about the early church and the way they lived. It says, Christians are indistinguishable from other men, either by nationality, language, or customs. They do not inhabit separate cities of their own or speak a strange dialect or follow some outlandish way of life. With regard to dress, food, and manner of life in general, they follow the customs of whatever city they happen to be living in, whether it's Greek or foreign. And yet... There is something extraordinary about their lives. They live in their own countries as though they were only passing through. Any country can be their homeland, but for them, their homeland, wherever it may be, is a foreign country. They live in the flesh, but are not governed by the desires of the flesh. They pass their days upon earth, but they are citizens of heaven. Obedient to the laws, they, they yet live on a level that transcends the law. Christians... Love all men, but all men persecute them. Condemned because they are not understood, they are put to death, but raised to life again. They live in poverty, but enrich many. They are totally destitute, but possess an abundance of everything. They suffer dishonor, but that is their glory. A blessing is their answer to abuse, difference their response to insult. They are attacked by the Jews as aliens. They are persecuted by the Greeks, yet no one can explain the reason for this hatred. You see, that was the early church. And this is to be the way of the Christian now, as we quite possibly may face future attack or persecution for our faith. And the way of the Christian should be humble, gentle response, 
yet with courage and fearlessness. Well, the drunkenness of the prostitute, she has set her aim on the follower of Christ and made it her mission to afflict those who stand opposed to Babylon and its ways. All right, one last point here. We've seen the prostitute's description, her drunkenness. Lastly, in verses 7 through 18, we see the prostitute's demise. The prostitute's demise. Now, as we come to the end of this chapter, we see that the prostitute and her influence does not last forever. It will not last forever. But rather, we read here where she is taken down and destroyed. Now, what's interesting, at least to me, is not that she is destroyed. What's interesting is who the Bible says she says takes her down. It's mentioned here in this chapter as the scarlet beast. You may want to write that out in the margin of your Bible, the scarlet beast. This particular beast is first mentioned back up in verse 3 of this chapter. And there it says that the woman, the prostitute, get this, was sitting on the scarlet beast, and the beast had seven heads and ten horns. And of course, here in verses 7 through 14, we're given some more information about the beast. Now, I will just tell you, be open and transparent here this morning, out of all the passages, difficult passages, that we have studied thus far in the book of Revelation, and there have been many, this by far is the most confusing. All right? Um, godly men and godly women throughout time have all understood these details here differently. And I told the first and second service this, listen, I feel as though, like, who am I to say here this morning, hey, I figured, I figured it out. I'm going to tell you what all this means. I've cracked the code. Uh, here's what it is. Um, I'm not going to do that this morning because I can't do that here this morning. Again, these verses here are very complicated and um, and he says there in verse 9, this calls for a mind with wisdom. And I'm like, yeah, huh. You, but you think uh, this, this takes some really serious just uh, attention. And, and, and I know there may be some of you here this morning, listen, I say some of you, like one or two, who are like really deeply interested in figuring out like the seven heads and the ten horns and the seven mountains with the seven kings. Like you're really wanting to figure out all that. And I would love maybe to have coffee with you later and we can discuss those things. Um, but for this morning... What I want to do is I just want to kind of give kind of a consensus of what I believe that, that this is teaching here, especially as it relates to us. Now, the scarlet beast that is mentioned here that is closely associated with the prostitute, I believe is quite possibly speaking of the same beast that we talked about back in chapter 13. Many, many of you may remember that. But this beast is an agent of Satan that seeks to help him fulfill Satan's plan in deceiving this world. And so like the prostitute, this beast, I believe, is yet another expression of a Babylon. It describes the systems and structures, nations and empires, kings and emperors who throughout church history have stood in opposition to Christ, his church, and the truth. So this beast at different times could be Nazi Germany and Adolf Hitler. At another time, the Soviet Russia under Stalin, North Korea and Iran. Communism under Lenin and Stalin, uh, ISIS, Planned Parenthood, the pornography film industry, the prosperity gospel and word of faith movement. It's all such organizations, leaders and groups that are used by the devil, again, to oppose the Lord, his church and his truth. And this statement here that we read a couple of different times in verse eight that says the beast that you saw was and is not and is about to rise I believe this is speaking of how at different times in church history, this beast has, has come about only to be taken down, but eventually will come back again in different ways. It's letting us know that there is this continual beast-like influence that will happen in our world that will seek to oppose God and his people. But what the text says that is rather shocking is that the prostitute and the beast are actually aligned. They are together in their attempt to oppose and persecute. However, according to verse 16, at some point, the beast will turn on the great prostitute. I don't know if you caught that. It's in verse 16. <coughs> verse 16, it says, And the ten horns that you saw, they and the beast, watch this, will hate the prostitute. They will make her desolate and naked and devour her flesh and burn her up with fire. And so the beast will use the prostitute, but then will turn on her. That's kind of interesting. It's sort of like a poem I heard this past week, or this limerick, that says this. It says, there once was a lady from Niger who smiled as she rode on the, tr on the tiger. They came back from the ride with the lady inside and a smile on the face of the tiger. <laughs> That's kind of what's going on here. 
The prostitute is riding on the beast, both standing in opposition against the Lord, but the beast turns on her and devours her. Now, the question in everybody's mind is this. What what is this talking about? What does all of this mean? I'm going to give a stab at it here this morning, okay? I personally believe that this means that, that at the end of the age, right before Christ returns, I believe that this speaks of how the allurement of the prostitute will be no more. I believe her charm and seduction will have lost its its lure. The world and its citizens will turn their attention away from her shine, and they will turn it on to something else. Well, what is that? I'm not exactly sure. Some have actually argued that what this is describing is how the political side of Babylon, of this world, will turn this ungodly world against the socioeconomic and religious side of this world and destroy it. In other words, religion and social and and material infatuation will be destroyed by a coalition of political and military powers. That could be what happens. But whatever it is, there will be this massive shift of focus and and affection. What what once was alluring will have lost its shine. Uh, What once was attractive will no longer be people's focus. There will be a new sheriff in town, so to speak, that will take over. In other words, people won't worry so much about the American dream anymore. Rather, they will be consumed with who's in charge, who's in authority, which nation is truly leading. And when that happens, the end is near. But now listen, regardless of how you interpret all of that stuff, okay, the overarching point is simply this. The American dream is headed for destruction. That's the point. That this world and all of its trinkets will only last but for a little while. A little while. One day, it's, 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 it's going to be taken down. Babylon will be no more. But the encouragement to us is this. Until that day comes, as believers, we are to resist the strong pull from this world to be pressed into its mold. And I know every single one of you as a believer, you feel that. How this world is trying to suck you in to be just like it. But as we live in Babylon and await our future Jerusalem, we are to resist the pull to become Babylonians ourselves. The Bible says over and over again how we as a church are to come out from this world and to be different. We are to remain separate from this world. And in doing so, show the world the joy that exists from knowing Christ and being forgiven and being changed by the power of the gospel. I believe in what C.J. Haney, C.J. Mahaney once said when he said this. He said, today the greatest challenge facing the American church is not persecution from the world, but seduction by the world. And I agree with that. And I don't know, maybe some of you here this morning who claim to know Christ, you have found yourself having become ingrained in the Babylonian culture that is this world. And maybe this morning as you sit here among us, you have become what many have described as a backslidden Christian. You have become one who has bought into the American dream. One who has sought to fill your life with worldly things, believing the lie that those things will indeed satisfy you. And maybe here this morning you're coming to the realization that it won't do it. Because maybe you have everything that this world has to offer, yet as you sit, you are completely empty inside. If that's you here today, listen, hear the gospel and repent of your waywardness. Do not believe the lie and do not be seduced by a world that can never, ever deliver on what it promises you. Trust in Christ. Believe in Jesus. Let's pray together. Oh, Father, we thank you that your word cuts through all the lies. And God, we thank you that while this world can never completely fully satisfy us, In Christ, Lord, in Christ, Lord, we find everything that we've ever wanted. Lord, satisfaction, fulfillment, contentment. Lord, we find the hope and the peace and the joy that we need. 
But God, as believers, we must admit that, Lord, Lord, as we live our lives in this Babylonian culture, God, there is this enticing, seduction, allurement, Lord, to commit spiritual adultery on you. And Father, for us as believers, we hate it. So Lord, would you forgive us where we have failed you? God, may we experience your unconditional love here this morning. But God, may we humble ourselves before your throne of grace, confessing our sins, repenting from our sin and rebellion, and claiming your mercy that is found in the cross. God, we thank you for loving us. God, we thank you for saving us. God, we thank you that you have indeed redeemed us and we belong to you. So Lord, may this time be filled with repentance, confession, honesty, obedience, faithfulness. Lord, we love you. In Jesus' name. Well, that does it for our worship services here this morning. And as always, we'd love a chance to meet you face-to-face if you're able. Uh, if you want to go to our website at understhesteeple.com, you can find out more information about our worship services as well as ministry opportunities to see how you might become a part of what God is doing here at First Baptist Church of Cleveland. Don't forget that tonight at 6 o'clock we have our Through the Bible study where we walk through the entire Bible book by book, chapter by chapter, and verse by verse. It's going to be a great time together of studying the Word and of worshiping the Lord. Lord. And so, as always, have a great rest of the week, and God bless you.